welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's sponsors are Early Bird CBD. They have a micro dose of THC in it, which is, it's amazing. It helps me sleep at night with being an athlete, former athlete, retired. This stuff helps. Actually, it's good for my joints. And like I said, the sleeping part of it is the best. So I recommend this. Go to earlybirdcbd.com and enter the code BIGHEADPOD. Get 20% off your first order. And most deliveries before, th- or any orders before 3 p.m. are d- delivered, are sent out that day. So try it out. Texas-based company. Try those out, guys, when you get a chance, too. So, And also Herman Marshall Whiskey. Gosh, we can't say enough about the whiskey. So nothing better than whiskey and a little bit of CBD. So today's guest, former teammate of mine, former Duncanville standout, and a guy who was a part of Major League history. And he has his own radio show as well. Let's introduce Mr. Mike Baxick Jr. Bass, what's up, brother? What's up, man? You're just knocking out all the Duncanville guys, huh? You gonna have Todd Ritchie on next? I'm, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try and figure it out. <laughs> I try and go through it. I think I was on a, a Blue Jay stretch at one point, and then uh, I figured, hey, why not? Let's go through Duncanville and see what we got. So I might have to get uh, good old Fred McDonald on here too. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and get on here. How you been, Bass? I'm doing good, man. Hanging in there. Cowboys hanging in there with your Eagles. So uh, you know, I know that'll be a fun Christmas Eve afternoon. Yep, absolutely. Are you going to go? No, I don't like going to NFL games. Uh, I, I understand how great they are. I just, I enjoy watching NFL games at home. So when there's all those breaks, when I feel like you're at NFL games, I know maybe people feel this way about MLB games too, but when I'm at NFL games, I just feel like there's a lot of break in the action when you're at the game. Especially here, you're, you know, you're looking up at the TV as opposed to, you know, you're, you're able to at home, I don't know. Do you do fantasy football or anything to that effect? Oh, so yeah. yeah. So your switch. Oh yeah. So you're able to check, you know, real time stats and, and everything else. And, you know, I mean, the amount you pay for parking, you can go buy a new TV, the size of the one you look at and right. And you're, and you're sitting there. So it's, it's the same thing with baseball, but I think it's, it's different. I think it's just the mentality that we have. I can't go sit at a baseball game, right? It's just, to me, it's just, it's, especially nowadays, it's just boring, right? We, you know, we've yeah. talked about this at length with, with former players. It's just, it, it's just not fun to really watch, is it? It it is a all or nothing game now, which I think I do think is going to change, Minchy. And I don't know when. I don't think it's going to change in 2023. But at some point, I think people are going to get back to how do we win today's game? Not hey, I think this. I think if we do this over 162 games, it will lead to this many wins because. I don't think it is leading to that many wins. And then analytics are never wrong because all you do is say, well, this analytic, you have to either give it more time or we're just going to adjust the analytic. It almost sounds like it's Nostradamus. I'm predicting because the analytics say this is what's going to happen, right? And it's, uh, I'm just not a, I'm not a numbers guy because it it takes out the human element, right, Mike, as far as the feeling of, of what, you know, like a pitcher, okay, so you when you pitch in a big league, you were, what, 88 to 90? Was that about right? Yeah, yeah, it was somewhere, you know, a bad fastball was 84, a good fastball was 89. So I was in that range. So, what I mean, what I wonder what the analytics say about that as far as a starting pitcher nowadays. Is that even, right, because we were, we were always taught you to throw above the hitting speed or you throw below it, right? And that was I about would. 92, 90, 92 was when we were playing. So, yeah. and I know these guns are juiced as well. Guys aren't throwing right. 107 miles an hour, right? They're just, they're just not that, right? They say that you can add three, even like driveline and all the new people who are putting in all the technology would even tell you if you take a game in 2005, let's say, uh, you can look at whatever was on the television screen is what they're throwing and just add three miles to it. And that's what they get from the guns now. So if I threw a pitch 88 on today's television, it would say it's 91 just because the guns are picking the ball better up right out of the hand than let's just say 10 or 15 feet out of the hand, which the closer you get the ball out of the hand, the harder the ball is going to be. It used to be a drop six or seven, I believe, uh, from our gun. That meant if you threw 90 miles an hour, by the time it got into the hitting zone or or the catcher caught it, it had dropped six to seven miles an hour now they drop three to four miles an hour from the time um 
I'm sorry, it drops. It dropped less than. Yeah. Sorry, drop, okay. if, if I, I explained it a little bit opposite, so I was screwed up there. But now, um, you know, they get way more of a drop range. So if you're throwing 90, by the time it hits the catcher, it's 84. When I threw, if I was throwing 90, the drop would um, be only 87. Yeah, so it's uh, and that's what they're not taking into consideration the sixty feet that it has to lose velocity, right? With with drag and everything else. So I mean, it, right? But it's all everything's numbers driven now. That's all it is, right? The stat cat, right. the angle that ball would have gone four hundred and eighty five feet, right? You, you know, it's you know, we go like, we go to Fenway. You know, the seat out in right field where Ted Williams hit that ball. I mean, you look out there. I mean, I don't think it hit a golf ball that far. No. You played in Washington because, unfortunately, I know you did. And um, <laughs> RFK, a, the old RFK. <laughs> yeah, there was a seat up there where Frank Howard hit a ball, and it just seems impossible to me. I know I don't even know if RFK is still there. It might be, but I mean, it shouldn't be. But where that seat was, you're like, where was home plate when Frank Howard hit this ball? But I mean, even like Tom Greve, my father, who played with or against Frank Howard, would say, no, that was a beast of a human being, and he could hit a ball. 500 feet i mean yeah you look at this he was six eight about 290 and you look at the the, the stride and the uh, that he got through through that zone but you're right that was in the it was in the upper deck of the old those were the old multi-purpose stadiums so you had the lower bowl and the upper bowl and that thing was was way up there but there were some guys that could, it's kind of like the ball that galarraga hit in old marlin stadium right up there that almost went out of the ballpark i think it was off kevin brown if i remember correctly <laughs> That was what I mean. That was that's the stuff you see. But I mean, you look at those guys, and balls are just. I mean, now the balls are. I'm surprised they haven't exploded yet. How about this, Minchie? Have you talked about the new report that just came out on Thursday or Friday that uh, Rob Manford was uh, messing with the balls throughout the 2022 season? So the Yankees were able to, as Aaron Judge was chasing the record, he was able to put the bouncier, live, liver ball in play for the Yankees and then at other stadiums or other times you would change back to the deadened ball. And they have three different balls that MLB uses kind of what you call consider a dead ball, an average ball and a ball with a lot of juice. And because Rob Manfred and MLB bought Rawlings and they now make the baseballs, they can choose which baseball they want to use in which game and the playoffs and stuff like that. And the players, don't know going into a game if they're using a deader baseball an average baseball or a or a lively baseball yeah i did i did talk to the the one of the um, the umpires here and they're the the umpiring crew that's i mean it's like hogging those guys they're not allowed to touch the baseballs anymore major league baseball does apparently all the rubbing up so they don't even know what they're getting and you're right though i mean you're I'm, in Japan, they had two different kinds of baseball. They had two. So, you know, like you said, here we used to have, I think back in the early, mid 2000s, we had those bud balls, the green ones that were kind of like the restricted flight ones. And then, other than that, you know, you had re- the regular baseball. So, I just can't believe that they're, the amount of money they're making, they're trying to change the game even more and more to that. I mean, I did see that. And you just, as so, as it, I wonder what the union's thinking about all this because of, you know, are you helping out your basically you're helping out pitchers at one point and then you're helping out hitters at another. So, you know, what are you telling the fans here? We're trying to we're trying basically we're cheating, but you guys aren't cheating, but we're cheating. So what you yeah. know, what do we do? What are we doing here? It's an unknown. You know, it would it's the thing that that they're able to and, and cheating's a tough word, but they're able to uh, change the game without really the fans knowing that they're changing the game. Because can you imagine if we went out to globe life for the ranger game and the outfield was an accordion and the outfield fence yep and if you if you had a really good home run hitting team you're like well we're going to push the accordion out and we're going to bring the fences in 10 feet because we want to hit homers tonight and if you had uh you know a certain game plan where you're like we're not going to get hit home runs we're facing you know framber valdez for houston we're not going to hit homers we're probably not going to drive the ball uh so we're going to make the fences really far today so we uh, limit Houston Astros home runs because we have a guy on the mound who can give up home runs. So we're going to push the, the fence 10 feet back so you can you can mess with the fence by 20 feet. And when you mess with the ball, you're messing with kind of 20 feet of where the ball is going to go in distance. Yeah, and it's and these guys are stronger as well. So why wouldn't, you know – so it's almost as if they're bigger guys, but let's let's use the mushier balls, kind of like an incredible, right? You hit it and it has that yep. flat spot on it. 
And I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering what the compression is on these baseballs as far as if they have the numbers exactly of what it was. But think about it. Okay, so, you know, we, we t- I was talking about earlier with Mike setting history. So facing when you face Bonds back in, what was it, 03? 07. 07. Okay, 07. And Matt, the baseball that you had knowing – or, or no, you didn't know, but these baseballs are wound a little. I know they they change them, so when there's records being broken, they're 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 stamped or whatnot. So who's to say that those weren't being tampered with as well, right? To say they were wound tighter because this record's being chased, or maybe because of you know they thought that Barry was taking steroids. Maybe they put a deader ball out there for you to throw. So I mean, is it? We 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 don't know now. All of a sudden, right? It's going to make you think though. To back when we were playing, did they do the same thing then? Because we know well, we did have those bud balls. Remember, they were green on the outside. I don't, I don't think so, and here's why. Rawlings controlled Rawlings. Big Baseball now owns Rawlings. So I think it would have been tougher for, let's say, Bud Selig, who was the commissioner at the time, to change the manufacturing of the balls throughout the season because he didn't own Rawlings. Major League Baseball just used Rawlings as the baseball that they were going to use. So I would find it difficult to do that. That being said, you are correct, Menchie. They did have, like, when I faced Barry Bonds on the night that he broke the record, there was a separate bucket of balls that were marked. So when Barry Bonds came up, and I'm, I forget who the home plate umpire was, but he would have to take the five balls out of his uh, pockets that he had and replace them with five baseballs that were specially marked. So if Barry Bonds did hit a home run, they would know whoever caught the ball that it would have a special bark on it to know that that is the real ball. Yeah. So, so going to that situation, Bass, what, what are you thinking of that night when you're fa- when you face Barry that night, you know, you're in San Francisco and he's coming up to, you know, he's coming up. What, what's your first thought going into that inning? I don't remember. I mean, I just remember watching the highlight. I don't remember. If, did you start the inning or was it one of those where you came in to face him or what was it? I don't remember who, Everybody was. I think I might have gotten out Ray Durham first. I think there was one. I got the first guy out in the inning. It was the fifth inning. I faced him earlier in the game, and he hit a single and double off of me. So I wasn't fooling him uh, much that day. And uh, he had had a tough game the game before. We had a kid named John Lannon, who was a rookie that year, left-handed pitcher, who had a really nice game the day before. Uh, and and I think Barry might have gone over three off of him because I was keeping the chart back in the old days where – the starting pitcher would keep the chart, which honestly really helped me to figure out what guys are doing in certain situations where now uh, I've asked the the, uh, the pitcher pitching the next day does not keep any chart or anything. He just watches the game. And um, I got to a 3-2 count there, and I threw a breaking ball on a 3-2 count, and he fouled it down the first baseline. And it was really close to being fair. And the scouting report at the time with Barry was, Even though he's older and you look at his stats overall and you say, well, he wasn't as good. He still had, I believe, his last year, Minchie, a 480 on base percentage. That was his last year ever in baseball. His his on base was 480. And so I threw a fastball away and it didn't get away. It ran back to the middle as a lefty. You know, unfortunately, if you get if you turn it over a little bit too much, it'll start coming back to home plate too much. And I didn't really reach out uh, great with my middle finger. I got that one finger and turned the ball over a little bit and it came back to the middle of the plate and he crushed it. But it was it was a special time because on the Nationals, we weren't a very good team. And all the teams that I played on besides my rookie year, the Cleveland Indians in 01, that was one of the few moments that felt like a real big game, like a playoff game sold out. Uh, so the atmosphere was very different from a regular season game. Yeah. And as soon as you let go of that pitch, you just knew. I mean, I know you see, we see, it, we see it on video. It comes. You're right. It just starts in the middle and then just ends up. And, you know, Barry had a really short stroke, too. And it was one of those where. Right. I, I think we, well, I mean, what were your thoughts as soon as that came out of your hand? You know, a lot of guys, as soon as they throw it, you know, they just put their head down because they know it's either going to end up yeah. probably in somebody's uh, trophy case. Yeah. I don't put my head down because I'm afraid they're going to hit it 110 back at my face. But you see the ball and you're like, oh, crap. It's amazing in that less than a second time that you can see that this is not going to be what you wanted to do. And, and so, yeah, when you, when I released the ball and saw that it wasn't going to get to the low and away zone that I wanted to get it to, because if you throw a ball, he's just going to take it. Yep. And um, the thing was, is 
our our pitching coach Randy St. Clair was like, hey, you can challenge him and go after him as long as the game's not on the line or runners are in scoring position. And there was one out, nobody on three, two count. I wasn't trying to throw it down the middle, but you know, that's the thing about major league pitchers for the most part. I won't say nowadays, but when major league pitchers miss, they're usually just missing by like six to eight inches on a big miss. And right there, I'm trying to go corner and I miss more middle. Well, that's a that's about six to eight inches. So that was a pretty big miss there. If, if the ball's another, let's say, four to five inches away and I only miss by a couple inches, uh, he hits the ball off the end of the bat. He might still get a hit, but he doesn't get a home run. Yeah. What what it's was Snide catching that night? Oh yeah. <laughs> what it's not what, what did Brian say to you after that? You know, it's funny. He didn't I can't remember anything that he said. You know, he was a great catcher and a good guy and called good games. I can remember Felipe Lopez uh coming to the mound as, you know, the whole crowd's going nuts and I think he's touched home plate and he's like, Don't worry, we got you. Um and that made it, I believe, five to four. I wasn't having that good of a game in that game in the fifth inning. Um, and then I remember Demetri Young consoling me about five minutes after that. They told us, hey, you can get off the field. This is going to take a while. And just sitting in the dugout, and I felt horrible. And uh, Demetri Young, our kind of team leader and all-star, could kind of tell that I was like, oh, no. And he's like, you're all right. You're all right. It's going to be fine. It's just, It's just a hit. It's just a homer, you know. And I went back out there and got the next two guys out. It was kind of like I wasn't really, like, locked in. I just went out there and pitched again and got the next two guys out. But it was a crazy moment. But then soon after, after that inning I was taken out of the game, you know, I kind of realized, like, hey, man, it didn't – it wasn't Mitch Williams uh, in the playoffs or in the World Series. It was a home run. It was a historic home run. And, you know, I kind of started getting over it in the – you know, in the clubhouse. Uh, after I was taken out of the game, but it was at the moment, man, I felt horrible. It's just like you said, it's just one of those things, but you know, like, you know, you were able to gather yourself and come back and, and just go out and finish the inning, which is, which is good. And that's, that's all, that's all it is, right? It's, you, you're going to do that. And that's, and I think Dave Stewart said it best. He said, hitters, uh, pitchers don't get hitters out. Hitters get themselves out, right? It's, it's, they're all, you're trying to throw over 17 inch wide, plate and trying to you know be accurate with everything and you talk about missing and nowadays you know we'll see guys you see you you, you know you watch enough sports mike to know that guys nowadays don't seem to want to want to pitch they just seem to throw right it's hitters don't they don't hit they just go up and swing the bat there's no you know you'll see guys set up outside off the plate and they're missing up and in at somebody's head i mean how do you miss by that much you know, what, what, do you, what are you seeing as far, you know, from, from, you know, from playing and, and, you know, and seeing this stuff and watching, okay, what, what are you seeing from these guys? How are they able to miss by, I mean, that's, not even, that's like, like throwing a hand grenade. I'm just going to hope it's going to be somewhere yep. near the plate. That's what they're taught, and that's what they're encouraged to do. I do believe that pitchers could have great command in today's game, but to have great command, it's very tough to throw the ball absolutely as hard as you can every time and throw the ball where you want. I could have probably thrown the ball two to three miles an hour harder. And you face certain guys. I couldn't do this, but I remember John Smoltz at an old age in 07. He's a starting pitcher again after starter, closer, and back to starter. And we get like second and third and one out or nobody out on him. And he's throwing the ball in the game like 92 to 94, maybe 95. And then he needs a strikeout, like in the third inning. And all of a sudden, first pitch, 97. Next pitch, 98. Then, like, a bastard breaking ball. And I was like, holy crap. This dude who's, like, around 40 years old just saw the moment and the situation and said, I'm going to leave it all out right here, and I'm going to get my strikeout that I need to get out of this situation. Well, nowadays – Everybody's trying to throw that from pitch one because you're told they're being taught this. We're never going to leave you out there to pitch tired and pitching tired is a trait and it's a great trait to have. Can you pitch when you don't have your best stuff? Can you pitch when your legs are starting to get a little bit tired? Can you get a guy out a third time uh, when he comes up to the plate? Have you shown him everything so many times that the third time up 
You have nothing left to show this guy. You've shown him. Well, yeah, the answer to that is now, yeah, I showed him everything the the first at bat. I don't even know if guys come back. Let's say, you know, Mookie Betts is leading off great hitter today. I mean, if he gets six pitches in his first at bat, he probably can go back and tell him the three major pitches that the guy throws already. And that wasn't the case back then. It was like, try to save one of your pitches through the first nine guys. So after I face nine guys, how many breaking balls have they seen? Maybe I've only thrown three breaking balls in my first 40 pitches, but my next 40 pitches, I might throw 15 breaking balls because now guys are like, I haven't seen it. I only had an average breaking ball at best, but if I didn't show it much, it worked better as the game went on or vice versa. I showed it a lot early and they're like, oh, he's going to pitch backwards a lot. He's going to throw a lot of breaking balls. And then that second time through, I'm trying to throw the ball more inside. And now they're like, what the hell's going on here? He's totally changed what he was doing to me the first time through. You will not see that anymore. They're just doing what they're taught. And that is throw all out as hard as you can go. If you only have three innings in you, we're happy with your three innings you threw. Yeah. So your relievers are going to end up with double digit wins and that'll be your Cy Young winners. And and you're right, you you, you know as a, so you're starting pitcher. You had basically th- you had three pitches, right, Mike? So yes. and on every every start, you're not going to have you you know as soon as you get into the bullpen, you start warming up. All right, well, I just the curveball, I'm not feeling it today, right? So you're going to have to go that you might slow down with your numbers on the curveball at that at that moment, right? Your you know your your changeup's not working today, and that's be, that becomes that rapport that you have with your catcher of knowing all right who are we facing today, what do we how do we need to change it. And you talked about when you were sit the game before, if you were starting the night before, you were charting, you know, understanding what you need to do, right? And so you were able to see it visually. And I think we learn best by writing stuff down, doing it, because it seems to be getting grain. So you were able to see, all right, this is what I need to do here tonight. Okay. And then you go out, you have your plan going to, as you go to the bullpen, what we're going to work, what we're going to use today. All right. Well, I'm not feeling the change up. So now how do we change it, right? How do we go to, uh, you know, you talk to your pitching coach and your catcher and go, all right, this is not, it's not working right now. We can play with it during the game, but so I mean, so you're not, so we're not even going to see that anymore. We're just going to see guys that are just going to go, okay, three innings, that's it. Um, seven man rotations and that's it. Right. And like you said, being able to throw, if you were 88 to 92, if I need 95, I've got it. But most kids, they, they, they don't do that. They don't, they don't just sit in a certain area and then when they need the explosive fastball, they use it, right? Or their best, their best changeup, right? So it's, well, I, I don't understand the mentality of what they're thinking. I mean, seeing this, I know, um, you know, you know, being, you know, your dad being a pitcher and watching that and seeing, what are your discussions with him about? I and mean, he watches a lot of this stuff too. What do you think about all this stuff? I, I just think that the game has gotten out of whack and it's because There's analytic people that have great degrees and they're really smart. They have unbelievable mathematic degrees from unbelievable mathematic colleges and they're hired and they're been given a lot of power. And it would be like me. I was talking about this. I use this analogy, Minchie. I'm watching soccer. I'm not much of a soccer fan, but I understand why a lot of people love it watching the World Cup. Well, you know, the goalie dives every time on penalty kicks, he either dives left or right. So if I'm an analytic guy, I've never played soccer. I've, I've never done it. Why not just kick the ball down the middle every time I've, I've watched 20 penalty kicks in the world cup, 20 out of 20 times, the goalie dives left or right, right. When the guy is about ready to strike the ball, guessing which way he's going to kick it. Well then just kick it right at him. Cause he's never going to stay there. Now a real soccer player would say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Do you understand that after about three or four times of doing that, the goalie's just not going to move and just catch the ball as you kick it right at him? But I'm I don't know. I haven't I'm just telling you what I see. As an analytic guy, I put the numbers together. Every time the guy moves, he moves 15 miles an hour to his left and down. And then another 40% of the time he moves 15 miles an hour and two is left down. So just kick it down the middle. You'll be, you'll be good. You'll get 20 for 20. You'll, you'll actually be 20 for 20 on penalty kicks. And a real soccer person would say that's some of the stupidest stuff stuff I've ever heard. Well, we're now to the game of baseball where they say, Hey, guess what? Your slider has a vertical break of this, a horizontal break of that. The spin rate is this, that is in the top echelon of sliders in the game. That's a top 10 or top 20% slider in the game. I want you to throw your slider 
two thirds of the time. I want you to now just be a slider pitcher and you'll just every once in a while, one out of four times, throw a fastball. Maybe one out of 10 times, throw a changeup. Well, does that make the slider effective? No, that doesn't make the slider effective because if the hitter keeps seeing it over and over and over again, you can talk about this, Menchie. You start locking in on how that ball is going to break, the speed of that ball, what it looks like out of his hand. But how is an analytic guy supposed to understand all of that on what the computer, the brain computer, the hitter is starting to now recognize what the, the pitcher is doing? Yeah, it becomes a cat and mouse game of understanding, of knowing, right? It's getting the fastball in, right? I know I'm going to get it. But, you know, a guy like you, you didn't throw, you didn't throw, you know, super hard. But if you threw me a fastball in, my mind's telling me now he's probably going to go change up away with, you know, with the movement, right? Because that's what it is. And then the same thing, it becomes that cat and mouse. And then you start to think, all right, now what's he going to write? If I put a good swing on that, now is he thinking this or that? But the problem is these guys don't think about that. They just go, well, the percentage say he's going to go back to this. It takes out the thought process of knowing, you know, what I can do, right? They want to talk about the feel, the feel of the game. They don't know what it feels like, like he's, to be facing Barry Bonds chasing a record, Right. They don't take that's You can't put that in analytical numbers. Right. You don't know what it's like to face a guy that throws. If you're going from a Jamie Moyer, who's throwing 80 to a Kyle Farnsworth, who's throwing almost 100. They don't know what that feels like. But the numbers say that, you know, with the blah, 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 blah. blah same, then that's what I mean. There's it. There's no more feel to the game. The the, the interaction, right. the feel with with it. You know, it's all about what well, the computer says this. So, you know. You go back well, to it, and it's and it's hard as anything because you you just want to go out and, and these the kids can't think anymore it, or they can't just let their abilities take over. A lot of these guys are just tremendous athletes, but you just don't see it because it's they're so wound up with information. Well, the other thing too, Minji, I know you got a boy uh, around my age, and my boy likes playing MLB The Show. Well, when I hit that power button on MLB The Show, you know what? Everybody's at 100%. And when I pitch Shohei Otani, Shohei Otani always has his good stuff. He might be a bad example because he usually has his good stuff in 2022. But if I punch in being a, a guy who covers the Rangers, if I punch in Dane Dunning, who's a sinker slider guy, and if it's not sinking and sliding uh, in the bottom part of the zone or below the zone, he's going to get hit pretty darn hard. Well, every time I throw a sinker and slider with Dane Dunning on, on the video game, it's going to be his best two-seamer. It's going to be his best slider. But that's not the case in real life. And I think that confuses a lot of the analytics. They're like, well, it would have worked if he would have just thrown his great stuff. But all right, well, let's – you know, you're not going to have your great stuff except like one out of every five times. You're going to have average stuff two out of five times. You're going to have maybe below average stuff one or two out of five times. And you're going to have really good stuff one or maybe two out of five times. And that's how you pitch. In today's game, Minty, think about this. Our best pitchers are still Justin Verlander, Cy Young, Max Scherzer, still one of the best, and nothing against those guys. But the best pitchers in the game are usually guys that are 27 to 32, not 35 to 41. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. These guys, it's it, it's hard to even even think about those guys because, you know, they, they they've learned to pitch. Right. They've learned to like Scherzer used to be throwing 98, 99. Right. He was that guy. He could throw. Now he's what, 92, 95. And when he needs it, he could throw it. And I think that that's what these guys have understood, because as much as, you know, the Verland, Verlander's a bigger guy. Right. He had a, a, a down year, I think, a few years ago you know, due to injury, but was still able to come back because of what he's been through, what his mind's been through. But, you know, as a pitcher, you know, you go out and um, throw in a bullpen. It looks great, right? Blah, blah, blah. But analytics can't take into the fact the amount of stress that is placed on the body in those situations where you've got to, like you said, you're not going to have your best stuff every day. So basically what they're doing now with baseball, they're going to put their, everything's their best at all the time so that – why not just play these like a like a video game? Remember, you remember baseball stars. You create the the best team because everybody was at their max all the time. But that's just not sports. Sports, your your body's designed to be a little bit slower, right? And you've that yep. becomes that mental adjustment, the physical adjustment. All right, what do I need to do to push through this? Right, not where all right, I need a sub. I'm tired. No, can you imagine if somebody like that said that? If you went in, you were at 35 pitches. Oh, I'm I'm really I'm tired right now. And your pitching coach would probably slap you upside the head and go, "What are you talking about?" Get back yeah. out there and throw. But that's not it, right? You're, th you're tired. Well, the, you know, these analytics, well, he can't pitch so many days in a row. 
I'm going to go and ask, how are you feeling today, Bass? I'm good. You're good for a couple. Perfect. Yeah, let's go. Well, the, the card says you, you can't pitch today. So yeah. what, so what, what do we, that's what I get. What are we teaching? What are we trying to get to? What are we, what, what is this becoming? Is it just, I mean, is it going to be one of those where, you know, you're, your sports gambling. Well, I can click my roster and then I just send it in. These guys are going to pitch today because it's DraftKings says they're they're at the top of their game right now. Yeah, I I do think I agree with everything you said. I just think it's going to change, and I don't know how quick it's going to change. Where we're going to get back to a more yes, analytics are going to be part of it, and all these numbers and biomechanical things are going to be part of it. But I think we've eliminated a lot of baseball people. And even if there are baseball people, they're told don't be a baseball person or you're not going to have this job anymore. Do what when our analytics group comes to you at 2 p.m. with this is the best lineup for today, uh, even though a guy right now is, <clears throat> let's say, seven for 10 in his last 10 at bats. Well, he's 0 for his last 11 against this pitcher. So don't play him today. And you're like, no, 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 he's hot right now. Like, let's give him a chance. I get that he's 0 for 11 in his career off of him, but right now he's swinging great. He's seeing the ball great. And the analytic person's like, I don't care. Here's the history of, of what he's done in the past off of a guy with this type of stuff. But I do think it's going to change because I don't think you can keep going down this route. We see in the playoffs, if you're pitching game three of a seven-game series and your starting pitcher only goes two innings, you're kind of screwed for games four or five. And one of those two starting pitchers really needs to give you six plus innings. So still in the game today, unless they're going to expand the rosters to 30 guys, then you're going to have 15 or 16 pitchers on a team, which owners will never do that. Cause that adds a lot more to your salary structure. You're going to have to have work hurt horses in your rotation. And we see in the playoffs when a guy screws you over and can't get out of the second or third inning, that it really hurts you. And usually Honestly, it really puts you in a tough position to win the series when a starting pitcher screws you over early in a series like that. Yeah, and it's and you're right. I, I just do you do you agree with the have to face with is it three batter minimum type of thing? I mean, I, when we played, you were in National League. It was it was a cat and mouse game, right? So yeah, right. if you want to bring a lefty in to face a lefty and then a righty righty, okay, then now you're shortening your your bullpen. But that's that's up to the coaching staff, the manager, to yeah. decide that not. Not the analytics or 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 baseball. That's that's what it what it's about. It's a chess match. You're trying to figure out the best avenue. And now you know they need to just get. There's no leagues anymore. There's no American League, no National League because if right. the, the DH um, is gone. But do you see the analytics in other sports? Other, I mean, it's it's really rampant in baseball. But do you see it as much in the other major sports? Yeah, I think we have, but it hasn't been as extreme uh, in basketball, right? Golden State changed the game where it's like either shoot a three or lay up or dunk the basketball. Well, that's like in analytically speaking, man, that's really smart. As long as you can shoot the ball like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. But if you can't do that, what the hell are we doing? We're going to have bad three point shooters shooting five to 10 three pointers a game. And we're going to end up shooting 53 point shots with guys who don't shoot the ball at a high percentage from that or guys that struggle to get the ball to the rim. But what if they are good in the 10 to 15 foot range? And you'll still see come playoff time, 10 to 15 foot range shots can play very well and win you a lot of basketball games. So I see that in basketball, but not as extreme as in baseball. In football, I think we've seen um, the passing game expand and throw more than run more. And I think now it's more of a kind of 60, 40 split or even maybe two thirds, 66 to 33% uh, type of deal and throw to pass. But we've seen over time, Minchie, because I know you love football. We've seen the rule adjustments where they make it more beneficial to throw the ball than run the ball by placing more rules uh, against the defense when you throw the ball yeah and and the dual threat the quarterbacks as well that can run the pocket passers are I, even in college football are you you know watching that are you seeing less and less of the pocket passers are you seeing more of the uh you know the chase young those guys that are that are mobile that are able to throw the ball that aren't built so much like a cam newton donovan nab but more of a jalen hurts type of body type they're a little bit smaller but they are able to to run and throw the football are you seeing i mean is, is it starting just to be that way even at the high school level are you starting to see that more and more that that level or you i mean is the pocket passer quarterbacks you know going to be obsolete kind of like a seven-man rotation in baseball or you think we're headed down that way as well 
In a way, yes, but also when it comes playoff time, and I know you're a big Eagles fan, and Jalen Hurts has improved tremendously this whole year. I was not a Jalen Hurts fan at all coming in. I thought, like, yeah, he can win 10 games, but he can't pass the ball in a two- to three-minute stretch where you pretty much running the ball is going to be really tough because if you stay in bounds, ask Dak Prescott about that in the playoffs last year, then the game ends because it just takes too too much time for a quarterback to run, stay in bounds with no timeouts, and then to keep that drive going is – you have to be able to be, to me, a pocket passer first, and everything else is a great secondary to have. I, I, you want a running quarterback. You want a mobile quarterback. You want a guy like Patrick Mahomes who can make plays out of the pocket or Aaron Rodgers in his prime making plays out of the pocket, whether it was running or passing. But I do think still the number one trait in a quarterback – is to be able to pass the ball from the pocket. And that's where Jalen Hurts has improved tremendously. And I still think for a pitcher, the number one trait is still commanding your fastball. If you can command your fastball, your secondary stuff can be average and still be successful. But if you can't command your fastball, you will still struggle at the major league level. Yeah, and we see that as hitters sitting in there knowing, watching a guy warm up, right? He comes in, this guy hadn't thrown a strike yet. And and then knowing... Then as a hitters, then you start to exploit it, right? You know what's you know that he's not that's not working for him, right? But because right, but let's be honest. I always tell them, I always tell my kids, pitchers are stupid. They will make a mistake. You you know if you, th- you they throw you their best pitch and you put your best swing on, you hit it a mile foul, they're not going to throw it again because they're thinking they know that you just put you, their best pitch. You just put a great swing. They're not going to do it again. So right, but I don't you, I don't see that with hitters nowadays. I see way too many three one cock shots guys are taking. They're taking three, two yeah. straight because they're they're guessing. They're guessing at what guys are going to throw. Well, well, they say in three, two count, 85% of the time in 32% humidity, he's throwing a curveball. So I'm looking for a curveball, and here comes a fastball down the middle. And these guys are just frozen. There's, I mean, 40 strikeouts in a game, seven, you know, 70 strikeouts. In a, what in the what is going on though? That's what I'm saying. There's, there's, there's no thought process to this. It's almost as if they yeah. might as well go up there blind and just start swinging. I love what you're saying because I get to work with Mark McLemore, who had 19 years in the major leagues as a guy who obviously he was a starter, but considered a utility guy because he could play a whole bunch of different positions. And there's so many times where guys get into fastball counts and then they look breaking ball. Well, if he throws a good breaking ball, most hitters in general, most hitters can't hit a good breaking ball. If I throw, and I didn't have a very good breaking ball, major league standards. A lot of people are like, Oh, I was like, no, in high school, it struck everybody out. But major leagues is very different than like playing in all all-star high school games is if I throw my good breaking ball, my, my breaking ball has good break to it. And it's in the bottom of the zone or at the last second breaks, just out of the bottom of the zone, you're probably going to hit under 200 on that pitch. So if you're looking breaking ball, in a 2-0 or 3-1 count, and I throw a good one, you're still not going to hit 400 or better off of that. But if I throw a good fastball, and you're looking fastball, let's say, because I throw two seamers pretty much away to a righty, that would be 75% of my fastballs. Well, if you're looking for that, you have a much better chance as a hitter. Hitters usually hit fastballs better than they hit breaking balls, especially if I throw a pretty good fastball or a pretty good breaking ball, most hitters will hit a pretty good fastball better than they hit a pretty good breaking ball. Yeah, and I've noticed that too, even at the youth level, even in the high school. The, these kids that throw hard, the guy, the, the high school, they can turn around. As soon as guys start throwing the off-speed stuff, you know, 75 to 85 maybe top with a foul they've got no chance because they they're geared one way there's no they're not able to make that that adjustment at all and and that's the thing it's just and you're right though but when you get to the major level you better you know how to do all of that the, you know the balance and everything else but i've watched some games and i just go what's going on you're better off throwing guys that throw 75 because they don't have a chance you know you throw yeah. that out well, there and then they're and then going from there then you throw another guy that throws harder and then those guys just light them up because that's all they see. But watching these guys, these gurus that teach, they don't teach how to hit an off-speed pitch. They ju- just hit the fastball. And that's fine. That's great and all this stuff. But like you said, Mike, guys, you, you see that as a pitcher, right? Your catchers pick up on it. They know that this guy can just hit fastball. And that's what your advanced meetings are about, just fastballs. Okay, we'll show him one, but you're not going to show him one to hit. Maybe in off the plate, right? And then it's just back to that that two seamer away, right? The poo away. Here it is. And you get guys rolling over, rolling over, swinging out of their shoes, missing balls by three feet. 
Well, I wonder this, Minchie, as you're talking about that, it popped in my head multiple things. Like Josh Young is going to be the third baseman for the Rangers. He's been hurt so much in the minor leagues. He doesn't have a lot of experience. And they're like, just learn it at, at the major leagues. That's very tough to do. Second, I wonder this, Minchie, is I've thought about this. In college, for the most part, like Kumar Rocker and Jack Leiter, the two last first-round picks for the Rangers, second and third overall picks, they didn't call pitches at Vanderbilt. Most colleges call pitches for the pitcher slash catcher. And I'm wondering when we're going to get to that in the major leagues. I don't want to see it, but wouldn't that be the next thing is that the analytic people are like, we are able to computer wise that ball crosses home plate. And I know there's now a pitch clock on pitchers, but I wonder how quick the computer will say after that pitch, it will then go into the pitching coaches or manager's ear, probably pitching coach. And then just like we see in high school or college, he relays the sign to the catcher. And now the catcher and pitcher are never calling a game. It's just the computer calling a game. Yeah. With their clickers and the things in their hat where I can't hear it, yeah. you know, like the, like the mic, the linebacker that's mic'd up that has the, yeah. you know, they're trying to hear it. What, what is going, I mean, it, and how is that not some sort of form of, of cheating, of knowing, being able to send it there, right? Okay, this, they're speeding the game up these clocks. Well, then that should be up to the pitcher and the catcher to figure out what to th- what's coming next of knowing what, yep. you, what you're going to do. So what, so what do you, are you really speeding the game up? I mean, it's, and now we've got people challenging everything. And Bass, it's just it's going a complete opposite way than what we've been taught. And it's hard, it, it, you're right, it, it's hard to, hard to watch because it's, it's it's all numbers you know you got ipads in the dugout i mean can you imagine if we had those they probably would have been thrown at each other somebody would have probably hit them and thrown rudy would have taken a bat and smashed every one of them and then probably smashed us with a bat if if we even thought about it right there's no interaction there's no watching the game to get to see what happened right because on the computer screen you only see what the camera see and when you're in the dugout you're able to see the game happen and kind of understand and, and, and get the flow and the feel of the game. Like you said, another thing the analytics can't pick up on, right? They don't, right. they don't see that. And there's humor, there's human interaction where, you know, and this is why you try to like, I played with Tom Glavin and he was great at this. You could never tell what he was thinking, whether he had a no hitter through five innings or had given up five runs through five innings. You could never tell if he was discouraged or upset with the umpire or felt like he was tipping his pitches. He never gave any emotional reaction to anything. And now they're teaching the total opposite. Give all your emotions out. Well, you should work off of that as a pitcher. If you swing off of me and I throw a two seamer and let's just say, I noticed that you pulled off the ball a little bit, but after you pulled off the ball, if you are like, mad at yourself and trying to work on your swing real quick before you get into the batter's box i'm like he doesn't believe he can hit this pitch i'm throwing that pitch again but if you swing and miss and you just kind of shrug your shoulders give a little check swing and get back in like all right let's go i'm like well he didn't show me anything i can just read his swing i can't read his emotional state right now and i think that it is a, a human thing. A human factor is, are you reading what the pitcher's body language is? Are you reading what the hitter's body language is? And that's one of those things that is really important to being a successful guy. And because Verlander and Scherzer and a lot of guys that pitched in the mid-2000s, like 2005, 2008, when they got brought up, Kershaw, they know all these things because they were taught by guys that pitched in the 90s and early 2000s about that stuff. Now, if you're on a team that doesn't have any veteran pitchers at all and their their oldest guy maybe pitched in 2012 was his first year to ever pitch in the major leagues the knowledge isn't getting passed down and so they don't know how to read body language they don't know how to read swings because really what they're doing is throwing as hard as they can whatever pitch they've decided to throw yeah and it's and yet you know it's an at bat to an at bat situation as a hitter of knowing like i said if you see the same pitcher of knowing you know, you know, I was going to come to this this situation. We were talking about you and I. I think we had two 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 at bats together. The first I think one, the three, first because I think you got a, a hit too. Yeah, the, well, the one went to left field, and then the next at bat, I knew you weren't going to throw it in. So I think the other next one went to right field because I was looking at the of knowing, like we talked about knowing what that just yeah. what pitchers would do. He's not going to throw it in, so we throw it away. But that's just I, you're not going to see that. It's going to be. A, a new pitcher wait what happened to the starter where'd the guy go right are you gonna have your closers starting just to like spring training games that, that's what this is coming to and it's just not 
I, that's what I said. It's just so hard to even watch because there's no, it just seems like there's no th- thought process to it. Guys aren't surgical anymore. Like when we played with a bat, they could sw- they could hit the ball all over the place. I mean, you played with some great guys. I mean, a guy like Ryan Zimmerman. Zim could swing. He could hit the ball wherever you wanted it, wanted him to, right? You had guys that Think could about do- when I came up, the first three batters in our lineup in Cleveland was Kenny Lofton, Omar Vizquel, Robbie Alomar. I mean, those guys were moving the ball around. Their job was to get on base for Jim Tomei and Juan Gonzalez to drive in. And then there's this beautiful word in baseball, which isn't really used anymore, sacrifice. Will you sacrifice yourself for the betterment of the team? And really, sacrifice has been taken out of the game. Yeah, it's become a me-first game, right? 17-inning games with, no, with, what, five hits because everybody's trying to do there. It's all about me. So I can get more followers and, and this and that. And it's just, it's changed Mike for sure. And, and, you know, you talk about it all the time um, on the radio and on the show with the guys about just how sports are in general. Right. And it's, and it's, and it's gotta be, it's frustrating. I know it is frustrating for fans for, you know, for us to sit here and watch, but we just, it just have to wait and see. You know what? I, I love what you're talking about here, Minchie. I want your opinion on this and maybe your experience coming up with the Rangers is, Trey Young, for example, plays for the Atlanta Hawks if you're just a baseball fan and not a basketball fan. He's kind of in trouble a little bit with his organization right now because they've given him the max contract and they need him to be a leader. Well, he's like, I don't know how to do that. Nobody taught me how to do that. And the reason nobody taught him is you're not supposed to pick on young players. They call it bullying. So you're not supposed to teach young guys. So when you come up to the NBA or major leagues and you're 19 to 23 years old, somewhere in there or something, you're told, no, you can't pick on that guy. You're going to hurt his feelings. You're going to ruin his confidence. You can't kind of tease him. You can't do these things. Well, then when you want them to become the star of your team, the guy you're building your lineup around or the guy you're building your basketball team around, you need them to lead your team. And they're used to other guys leading the team back in the day for the Mavs, Dirk Nowitzki or whatever. And they're like, nobody taught me how to do this. So what are you telling me? And now all of a sudden the babying guys and not allowing veteran guys to somewhat pick. I know pick and bully is a bad term. But teach these guys, and sometimes through tough love, because you're not allowed to do that because general managers don't allow it to happen anymore, and they tell their coaches, do not allow that to happen to my baby boy. Then you get guys that become 23 or 25 years old you're expecting leadership from, and they're like, well, I never saw anybody lead on the team before, and nobody taught me how to do this, and then come to find out. Well, they were told, don't teach this kid how to do it. So now that you want him to be a man, he's like, nobody taught me how to be a man. I go, I basically go to the, the, the boy who cried wolf. You know, he's complained all the time. It hurt my feeling. Well, then finally you want, somebody wants you to actually take control. Well, nobody taught. Yeah, they tried to, but you didn't want to hear it then. Now it's kind of like maybe he's matured to the point of, oh, I need to hear it. But it, and it, it's, you're right, as, as a parent, as a coach. So what do you do then? Uh, I don't know. It, that's a hard question because was, you have guys around who was you. Who the guy that helped you? Who helped you when you came up to the major leagues? I was fortunate enough to have a lot of guys that were seasoned. I mean, the name Kenny Rogers, Alex Rodriguez, Palmero, Pudge, Juan, uh, Ishmael Valdez, Herbert Perry, uh, Oral Hershiser, guys that had stripes on that were there. And then as I got progressed, I got older and played, I had Brian Jordan's Eric Young's. There were guys there that were going to grab somebody by the back of the neck. And if they didn't like it, we're going to get in their face, right? It's remember the days when you go out back, let's punch each other in the face. Are we good? We're good. Let's go. Now you can't. Now it, you said you hurt somebody's feelings. I'm going to call. And what well, it goes, that goes back to this, this UIL rule, right? The NIL stuff, right? All this marketing stuff where you're paying high school athletes to do that because, well, I'm just not going to play. You've got guys not playing in bowl games because they're afraid of getting, you played eight, more, eight other games during the year. What it's one more game. What do you, right? So what are you doing? What are you telling people? Yeah. It's, that's what I'm saying. It's about me. What, and, what and do the, I need to small- do? The small thing, Minchie, of something like this, what would happen to us? I came up my first year in the major leagues was 2001. What here's what would happen to me. This is just a little thing that uh, people would say, well, it's not really that big of a deal. Stretch is at 3 p.m. And I'm a rookie or a guy who really has very little time in the major leagues. And I come jogging out of the dugout at 3 p.m. as they're just starting stretch. I'm going to get, I'm going to hear it from Charles Nagy. I'm going to hear it from 
Burba. I'm going to hear it from maybe Jarrett Wright, who was a younger guy, but had already pitched in a World Series in 97 and had four years of experience. And they're going to get really mad at me. They're going to embarrass me and they're going to make sure it never happens again. And they're going to pull me to the side and said, at no point should you ever be walking out of the dugout at 3 p.m. You should be ready to stretch with your, with your, where you're at right now. You should be on this field at 255 at the latest. But now you're not allowed. If some, I hear young guys come out sometimes for three o'clock stretch. They just kind of mosey out at 305, be like, hey, I was in the training room. I'm all right. I don't need any of this. No, you wouldn't be allowed back in the clubhouse because there'd be something missing. Your stuff would be gone. It, there's right because there's always that guy. There's a guy that's going to pull you aside, but there's also those guys that are going to go through there and they're going to. You might not see your stuff for a while, yeah. right? They're going to they're going to figure out a way to do it on top of it. So I mean, it's but these are small things that lead yeah. to big things now in the game. Exactly, and that's what's changing. And it's and it's up to guys, the old, the old school guys. It's becoming this new school about this me first mentality, and it, and it's tough. And it's and like you said, you see it in all sports. Um, you know. Hockey, I don't know because I'm sure I'm sure they do, but I'm sure there's still guys that are going to punch them right in the face, right? Because hockey players just they're just a different breed in general. So, you know, it'll be interesting down the road, Mike, to see how this transpires these next few years of how this between all the sports and uh, and uh, with this, and we'll just have to revisit this, you know, down the road and see how it how it goes, yeah. man. But you know, I, I, I'll tell you this. I'm really happy with our former teammate. I really do think Chris Young is going to be one of the leaders in getting the game back into the center. And what I mean by that is, yes, you need all the analytics. You need those mathematicians giving you all these numbers to maybe take advantage of something in a certain situation or certain games. But you need Bruce Bochy's and you need Mike Maddox's and you need guys that really can see the game, teach the game, get on your ass. Uh, and then also use the numbers when you need the numbers. So I do think it can get back to a really beautiful game, but I do think it needs to be more maybe general managers like Chris Young leading organizations. Yeah, that's the, that's that old school group of guys that's coming in. They had they had Bochy pegged, I think, from the beginning, as soon as Daniels was gone, probably even before that, of knowing. That's why it didn't take long. So, yeah. you know, we'll see You know, we'll see that how they move with, with the decisions they make. It's going to be probably be a, another year or two just to see, let these younger guys go. But, you know, it, it's interesting to see how, you know, how they're going to end up. But I think they're going in the right direction with those two. So we shall see, man. But, but, uh, but anyway, we'll, like I said, we'll go from there and see what happens. So, but I appreciate you jumping on here today, Mike. Thanks. I know you've got to get on the air. So you guys yep. listen, get a chance to listen to Mike 105.3, the fan from what, 10 to 2? 10 to 2. 10 to 2. Make sure to follow them and follow us here on the Dub Network, uh, Big Head Pod. And uh, we'll bring Bass in again uh, another time and, and see how this all this works out. So, man, I appreciate it, Bass. Yep. And uh, sure. anytime you want to talk more about baseball or anything else, you, you know how to just give me a shout, man. I'm always ready yep. to go. So, Well, good. I'm, you know, I'm your confidence builder. I don't know what you came <laughs> into Washington batting, but you batted a lot better after it was over. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that, Bass. So I appreciate it. So, but yeah, I so appreciate it, Mike. And I will be in touch, man. Thanks.